Good morning, everyone. <laughs> everyone here in the sanctuary, everyone at home, or wherever you're tuning in from, welcome. Um, all are welcome. I have a few announcements. Uh, I'd like to start with just reviewing our COVID policy, our COVID practice. To reduce the spread of aerosols during our uh, worship hour time that involves singing, chanting, and speaking. Oh, I'm supposed to take this off. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and speaking, we are taking the following precautions. All are to remain masked in the sanctuary with the exception of the pastor, liturgist, hymn leader, and soloist while at the pulpit microphone or designated microphone. Masking is optional in all other spaces in the church building, although always a respectful choice. This includes optional masking in the narthex during worship service. I would like to introduce Reverend Jennifer Jacobson, who is our guest preacher today. She's a chaplain at Chaplaincy Healthcare. She serves as a chaplain at Cadillac Hospital and Benton County Jail. Jennifer is ordained in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and an elder at Northwest Church in Richland, where Reverend Miriam Gentle is the pastor. Jennifer was raised in Richland, and her father was one of the founding members of the Tri-City Chaplaincy. She's a graduate of Bright Divinity School at Texas Christian University and has specialized education in pastoral theology and pastoral care for military and families. Shalom is delighted to welcome Reverend Jennifer Jacobson to the uh, pulpit this Sunday. And we are grateful to Gretchen Hormel for lending Shalom her Salilo Falls blanket. The blanket will grace the sanctuary wall behind the pulpit for the remainder of the month. Depiction of Salilo Falls and Native American fishing fit well with our creation theme and raising awareness of Orange Shirt Day at the end of the month. And this morning, Pastor Gentle um, emailed uh, a few of us with um, an announcement and Beverly will share that with us. This is difficult. Um, Catherine Petty passed away yesterday. Um, as many of you know, she went into hospice care a few weeks ago. She could no longer eat and she chose not to get any additional care. Um, she was at hospice house for, for a while and was able to be at home the last week. Beautiful view at peace. She was continuing to visit some of us were lucky enough to visit with her, and um, she kept, she was alert. She, she was engaged, she knew what was going on. She was still discussing politics. Uh, she was uh, doing her crossword puzzle the last time I saw her, a few days ago, um, and she had just watched the service from last week. Um, and she kept her wonderful sense of humor, you know, just always funny. Um, 
she was able to see all of her, her children, all three of her children, all of her grandchildren, all of her great-grandchildren, and, and visit with them over the last few weeks. Um, she was ready to go. She was at peace. But we won't miss her. Thank you, Beverly, and I will add that um, in the email Pastor Steve received, it says, um, Carolyn, her daughter, will be in touch about arranging a memorial service for mom, and she is, um, Carolyn, is going back to Spokane for a few days. Thank you. Please rise in body or spirit and join me for the call to worship. We walk in wonder beneath the sun and stars. Creation is God's masterpiece and we are blessed to share it. We give thanks for the air, the land, and the water. And for all the creatures joined together in the web of life. Beauty is before us around us, over us, and beneath us. We join our hearts, minds, and spirits as one in thanks and awe. Oh. Hymn 305, you servants of God, your sovereign proclaim.
Let's take a deep breath and have a moment to center ourselves and call to mind our joys and concerns before we share them with each other. I would like to share that I am thrilled beyond belief to be here with y'all today. It's a delight to be Pastor Stephen's understudy. I am I'm thrilled. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity, and thank you, Dana, for putting the bug in his ear. Um, I want to share, though, that he tells me you all are so civilized about this. Uh, the Methodist church that I sang at frequently back in Dallas had a fee. It was $1 if you were going to tell tales of your grandchildren and $5 if you were going to share pictures. So just, <laughs> just saying. Truly, and they added it all up into a fund and then had some beautiful offering that they, they gave with that, but just, I understand you're kinder to each other. The, the joys and concerns that I was handed to get us started, uh, Joyce has asked for healing thoughts, thoughts, prayers, good wishes, all that, toward her husband, Roger. There are continuing concerns with his blood pressure. So that, that cleansing breath, that's good. We'll use that as a prayer for Roger's blood pressure as well. And then we had an anonymous uh, request for prayer uh, from a, a person who suffers from worry and anxiety, uh, feelings of paranoia, bad social anxiety. Some of us can relate to that, around being around people. It's hard to be a human if you're not com in contact with other people. Um, and this person asked that we pray to calm the fear to be, and free him from the 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 fear and grant peace and, and fearlessness and pray that God will be with him and ease his fears. Um, uh, and a prayer we can all get behind, I suppose, that we'd be overwhelmed with God's love every day. God's boundless, limitless love for us. We can uh, feel it and be in touch with it every day. Now. What are y'all feeling? What are we giving joy? What are we concerned about today? Any takers? I believe, Miss Lorinda, we, would you like to bring the, are you bringing the microphone around? Okay. There you go. No, wait, do we need to? Oh, is that how it works? Okay, sure. Oh, you please do. Yeah, all right. And just, you just walk me through this, y'all, okay? Put my mask back on. All right. Who's going to be the first? I have a joy. Uh, I got a knock on the door the other day, and uh, there was this long-haired guy on a bicycle at the door, and so I got to sit and have coffee and uh, with uh, Steve Erickson for a while. My dollar. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm a new grandma. <laughs> Owen was born on Labor Day at our family cabin on Vashon Island and everything was wonderful and he's gorgeous and I'll put my dollar somewhere where uh, y'all want it. Yeah. Blessings on the family. My joy is that the Russian troops in Ukraine are in a rout. The Ukrainians are winning. All right. Peace be with all. And you, sir. Yes. Um, prayers for my wife, Cindy. Uh, she's got a sore throat. Just, just, you That's know. totally legit. Yes. Soothing and healing for, for Jim's wife. All right. Anybody else on my side? Any you know, joys, concerns? Huh? <laughs> just offer uh, travel prayers for our colleagues who are returning from incense and today. Traveling mercies, absolutely. Oh. Hi, I am, I'm Dana, and I have a joy that my daughter, Devin, has started nursing school this week, and I'm very proud of her. <clears throat> and of course, I'm proud of all my kids. Do I owe 50 cents so if you just talk You're about fine. your kids? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyway. I have joy for all 10 of my grandchildren, but that would kind of break my bank, so. Any more joys or concerns to share? But we ask that, that our hearts understand that there are many that are left unspoken to the group that we still lift up 
to the love of the universe to the Lord. So again, before we pray, let's gather our hearts, lifting up these individual prayers and joys, Grandma, and all our concerns. And would you pray with me? All holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the wonders, the mysteries, the blessings, and the beauty of creation. Open our hearts, attune our spirits to your voice and presence as it flows through, sustains, and fills all the earth. Grant that we may come to know you more deeply. May we hear more clearly the ways that you call us to care for your creation and for one another. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, I saw a couple of youngsters. Either or both of y'all want to come on up and chat with me for a minute? And even if you don't, would you? Just because, you know, I had a few thoughts. <laughs> okay. I guess I'll... Well, hi. Oh, you guys, now I'm going to have to look both directions. So I see your name is Atticus. I'm called Jenny. And what's your name? Miriam. Miriam? Oh, that's beautiful. All right, you guys. Um, all right, today uh, is the third Sunday in Pastor Steve's series about creation. And he told me at the beginning it was called Stormy Sunday. All right, storms. Well, let's talk about the weather for a second. Um, and this isn't the right piece of paper, but that's okay. We'll wing it. Um, what do you call a beautiful day? What, what does a beautiful day look like to you? You know, weather's wise. A sunny day, okay. What's, what's beautiful to you about the sunny days? Got it? The sun. The sun. What, are you one of those that looks right up into it? Do you get spots in your eyes? What is the sun? I like those sunny days too because it helps me see everything clearly well when the smoke's not in the air, right? That's beautiful, and you can see it kind of shimmer on the grass, can't you? I like that. Yeah, sunny days. How about you, Atticus? What do you think of, uh, and when you think of a beautiful day, what's a beautiful weather day for you? Like, I imagine walking outside and, like, yeah. basically a lot of what Miriam said. Like, I imagine mm -hmm. walking outside and the, and the sun yeah. is shining and, and there's dew drops on the grass. Oh, fairies left the druid up. Absolutely. So you like those sunny days too. Okay. Yeah. Does that mean you like summer better than winter, or maybe you like spring because the weather's not quite so ridiculously hot? Like. Honestly, I like fall better because. Okay. Know, it, it's gonna start winter early, or it's gonna start winter late. So you're able to see the beauty in, in the changeableness that. Yeah. Some days you wear a sweater in the morning to school, and some days, you know, you run around short sleeves in the afternoon. Okay. But I like all the seasons the same, which is a whole lot. That's cool. Okay, a thousand years ago, well, last, last century, anyway. When I was a little kid back in 1966, there was a song written that I just loved. Let's see. I saw raindrops on my window. Joy is like the rain. Have you ever heard that one? Yeah. It says that joy, that joy, it's kind of deeper than happiness. I mean, happiness can be, you know, you got chocolate pudding or something for dessert, but, but yeah. joy is something deeper, you know? That joy can be like the rain. And the second verse is, I saw clouds upon the mountain. Sometimes they're silver and sometimes they're gray. Joy is like the, the cloud, or joy is like the storm. I want to, to, to um, encourage you both and all the big kids out here to, to rethink what we call a beautiful day. All of the, beautiful, all of the weather is, is part of this creation. All of this weather is needed to 
bring the bring the the rain bring the sun bring the nourishment all around that's part of that wind is is how some of the the pollination takes place not just the bees right and also, like, and also explains that like there is a whole lot of different ways you can feel joy bingo absolutely got a budding theologian on both sides of me this morning all right so if you, if you get to play on the computer with parental consent, of course, look up, joy is like the rain. Okay. Bit by bit the river flows, till all at once it overflows. Joy is like the rain. Thank you for coming up. I appreciate your help, my budding theologians. Yeah, it does? Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Now, after the children, okay, it's time for the call for our gifts and offerings. All right, and I understand we have ushers or deacons who will take care of that. So we say that in a world filled with blessings, even the blessings that we have to look real hard to identify, we celebrate our privilege and our responsibility to share them. Let us continue our worship through the sharing of our offering. And I gotta say, young Mr. Master Wally, your music is one of the most beautiful offerings I have heard. Thank you so much. That, that gift, oh, just beautiful. Thank you.
God of creation, you water the earth and send forth food. You shower us with grace and feed us with your love. Accept these gifts, humble though they may be, and use them to spread your goodness throughout the earth. Amen. Thank you, choir. The scripture today is Psalm 29 from the Inclusive Bible. Give glory to Yahweh. You heavenly court, give Yahweh glory and strength. Give forth the glory that God's name deserves and worship Yahweh in the splendor of holiness. The voice of Yahweh resounds over the waters. The God of glory thunders over the raging seas. God's voice is powerful. God's voice is full of majesty. The voice of Yahweh snaps the cedars, shatters the cedars of Lebanon. It makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. 
The voice of Yahweh strikes with bolts of lightning. The voice of Yahweh shakes the wilderness, the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of God twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in God's temple all cry glory. Yahweh sits in judgment over the flood. Yahweh is its ruler forever. Give strength to your people, Yahweh. Bless your people with peace. I wanted to make a comment about the use of the, of the uh, spelling out of the tetragrammation of the YWHW, the Yudhe Vav Hey, into the word Yahweh. I ran this by Steve the other day, and he says, oh yeah, they'll, they'll eat it up. Um, that's what we have filled in to make it into a word. The actual place in the Bible, and you probably already know this, uh, it's just these four Hebrew letters. There's no, there's no vowels, there's no indication of how one in the early context would actually pronounce this. It's just there, the yud, the he, the vav, vav yud, he, vav, he. And it's, no, it would be this direction because Hebrew's backwards. Um, so it has no vowels. And part of that is because that, that was the, the divine name of God that was considered too holy even to pronounce. That when God gave God's name to Moses, it was, Eye, Asher, Eye, I am, or I am that I am, I am who I am. And that was God speaking in God's, God's uh, first person. And then when that was recorded, that name and God is to be revered and, and um, kept holy. So the tradition is in um, Jewish practice not to pronounce it. So what do you do instead? You've got this, this unpronounceable set of letters that come up. Well, we've, we've come up with, and you'll see in your Bibles, Lord. But they do it a little bit differently. The typography is different. It's capitals, L-O-R-D, usually like squishy ones, L-O-R-D. And that is to indicate that's what's taking the place of the holy name of God. And in that case, Lord is, is, um, uh, is the name, substituting for the name, not the title like, oh, my lords and ladies. We've had a lot of that after the Queen Elizabeth has passed, lots of lords and dukes and things like that. And the thing is, we kind of chafe a little at the idea of Lord. Um, we don't have that sort of a system. We, we think of ourselves rightly as all of us as children of God, all of us with equal access, all of us uh, beloved in God's sight. So Lord, the title doesn't sit well. And our ear can't tell the difference when we're reading it out loud between the all caps word Lord that is the substitute for the holy name of God and the capital L regular type Lord that is like oh my liege. So in seminary, we were encouraged by my Hebrew Bible professor, Dr. Wilda Gaffney, who's got a lot of stuff on YouTube if you want to see her, she's freaking amazing, to come up with what would we say instead. And I was like in our first class of Hebrew Bible in seminary, a little overwhelmed. What do you mean I get to pick a name for God? Um, some folks use Adonai. That would be the, um, the Greek, the Adonai for Lord. That's, that's beautiful. But she also encouraged us to come up with other names. And as long as, since, 19, or since 2014, when I started seminary, I continue to look for places uh, where there are other more descriptive, even more inclusive names for the Holy One. Uh, I, I sometimes fall back on the Holy One of old. That one's good. One of my favorites lately has been She Who Watches Over. Because in this time of, of COVID and in my job at the jail and at the hospital and the hospice house and on call, I need to know that she who watches over, watches over me and watches over all of, all of the, the patients and the families that I deal with. So I would encourage you to give it a try when you're reading or when you're listening. What descriptors might you have come up with in, in when you were translating or creating your inclusive Bible? What names for God resonate with your, with your heart? So that was not the sermon. I just had permission to, to share that with you. But today is apparently, as I told the kids, the third Sunday of your, of your um, like, 
what is this, creation series. Uh, and today is Storm Sunday, as you could hear, the, the voice of God with uh, causing all of the, the great cedars of, to, to even be flattened and the, the God of glory and the thunder and the lightning. So we're talking about climate and other changes today. Um, I'm also accustomed to introducing myself. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny, and my pronouns are she, her. That's how I would normally introduce myself, so now I'm really at home. I am a replant to the Tri-Cities, not a transplant. Uh, as was said earlier, I grew up here, but I didn't start out here. <laughs> I was born in San Francisco, California, and we moved from beautiful Marin County, California, when I was about five years old. It's in time for kindergarten, when my dad took a job with Battelle Northwest out in the area, circa 1966. Yeah, do the math, but on your own time. The family folklore says that when we got to Richland, my mother cried for two years straight. <laughs> the only green thing she saw was the now painted blue bridge over the Columbia River. I tell you, a lot has changed in the 30, 40 years since I lived here. I moved back just three years ago. After I graduated college, I went to California again, and then to Texas. Let's see, Jake was four, he's turning 35, so yeah, 30 years in Texas. And then when it, I needed a uh, res place for a residency, and chaplaincy health care came up on the, on the computer, it was just too much of God giggling in the background at the, the beauty of it all coming full circle. Washington, the evergreen state, and the beautiful <laughs> Pacific Northwest. Now even this side of the state has changed a lot. There's, there's even more growing. It's changed the color palette and the flavor palette of what we find at the farmer's market and what I see driving out. I, there weren't as many vineyards and, and orchards that, that we have been blessed with because of irrigation. And I think I might have even felt a tinge of humidity that wasn't there back when I was, you know, a kid. Whew. <laughs> so, but I tell you, I, even with that little bit of humidity, the, the winds still roll, and boy, do those tumbleweeds pile up outside of the Walmart. That was like a welcome home. <laughs> but when I was young, maybe a sixth grader at Jason Lee Elementary, I remember a headline in the Tri-City Herald. My mom was an editor with the Herald for 20 years or so, and it said, 1990, Wear a mask or die. Dun, dun, dun. <sighs> Wear a mask or die. Little kid me was terrified. The Herald published a series of articles predicting the future of America if we continued to pollute the air the way we were. Smog was a threat to our health and wholeness, to our agriculture, which is a big part of our way of life. Not just down south in the big city of Los Angeles, but all the way up the coast and through Oregon into the Columbia River Gorge. I was terrified. I remember counting the years forward. How old was I going to be in 1990? And I was going to be a grown-up, but my daddy wasn't going to be there to protect me anymore. And I, I might even be married with kids of my own, and was I going to be able to handle it? But it didn't happen. The mask wearing part, I did get married and I did have kids. But thankfully, back then, the politicians and scientists got together to tackle the problem. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was created. On their recommendation, the offending manufacturers and factories were regulated, taxed and fined the heck out of their offending ways. Unleaded gasoline was developed and made standard for our cars something called a catalytic converter that folks have been trying to jack off in your cars lately, lessened the impact of auto emissions. And I remember that Keep America Beautiful ad with the, the polluted river with all of the trash floating in it and the stoic Indian with the headdress standing there and the tear running down his cheek. And I bought in, all of us did, but it turned out that this ad was more effective than we even imagined it was supposed to be. 
And it was also extremely problematic. The Keep America Beautiful Foundation was no more an environmental advocate than old Iron Eyes Cody was a Native American. He's Italian. And Keep America Beautiful Coalition was a group of beverage companies who were and are decidedly anti-environmental. What they succeeded in selling us was the lie that the corporations had very little to do with the pollution. Oh. Yep, the public, they sold the public on the lie that it was our fault, that our disposables and consumables were really what needed to be handled and just, just turned our focus away from their own culpability for the pollution production. And we, like, like the beautiful consumers we are, we bought it. We accepted the blame and the threat of exorbitant fines if our trash was found along the highway. That's part of the Don't Mess With Texas campaign. Nonetheless, things got better. And slowly we forgot. We appreciated how clean the air and water had become, but soon we forgot that we the people, what we the people had done to keep it that way. And since we believed that lie that it was all our consumer fault anyway, we kept recycling our newspapers and soda cans and petitioned McDonald's to stop using those styrofoam containers for their burgers. All well and good. And every so often we might have stopped to wonder why we didn't hear any more about holes in the ozone. Well, that's because scientists back in 1974 found out that the use of chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs, were depleting the ozone and highly toxic to human beings. And in 1976, under the Toxic Substances Control Act, the EPA banned commercial manufacturing, commercial manufacturing of CFCs and aerosol propellants. But that thought fluttered away as quickly as it came. 1990 passed. <laughs> And then 2000, and 2010, and 2020. And in our forgetting, we are also not paying attention to the deforestation in the Amazon, the bleached coral reefs, thawing permafrost, shrinking glaciers, rising seas, all distant problems, not in our backyard. And we didn't notice the rollback of those regulations. We ignored the outsourcing of industry and manufacturing to other countries. For the, for the same reason, ignoring environmental and human impact of such moves for our own comfort and economic gains. Cheaper labor and the flattened global economy meant big box stores could offer us lower and lower prices while preserving their bottom line. We didn't question the ethics or larger impact of moving technology, development, and production overseas. After all, the companies we worked for needed to make larger profits so that their money could trickle down into our waiting hands. As a whole, the American public seemed to get more riled up about the straws we use for our caramel frappuccinos than an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico or groundwater contamination from fracking and those kids in Flint who still don't have water to drink. We joke sometimes about having added a season between summer and fall, we call it smoke or wildflower season, wild, wildflower, that's May, wildfire season. And it's funny when we're just, when it was just California, you know, down south and until it wasn't funny anymore and some of us nearly lost our homes when the fires came so close to the outskirts of Richland a couple years ago. And then we had that 10 day stretch of extremely hazardous air that just got stuck here in the Columbia Basin. You remember that? When our air numbers were worse than Mumbai and Beijing, we had the worst air on the planet. Now we kind of shrug and ex expect it. Yeah, August, early September. I'm gonna pull the mask out because it's gonna be smoky. The impact hazardous air on human and animal health, on the conditions needed to continue to grow those crops that feed us and the rest of the world, on the farming industries that supply the livelihoods of so many workers, well, that's no laughing matter. And eventually we did start wearing masks. Well, some of us did anyway, and some of us still do. Because we landed in a global pandemic 
Nobody escaped. Every continent on the planet, every country, every economy worldwide, 605 million people died. More than one million of those in the United States. In part, because we allowed ourselves to be distracted by hearsay and nonsense rather than staying focused personally, communally, and politically on the disaster at hand. And it has cost us dearly. In the United States, we lost one-fifth of our nursing cohort. One-fifth of all of our nurses left the profession. I encourage you to go down that information rabbit hole sometime when you're, when you're thinking about it, especially if your loved one has a surgery coming up and there's delays. Climate change is a key factor in the rise of diseases such as good old COVID, and pollution is a contributor to the increase in severity of diseases and their impact upon humans. Diseases once thought eradicated by a vaccine are surfacing again. You've heard of it, paralytic polio in New York City smallpox, measles, other diseases that don't typically threaten our comfortable American existence. They're not just over there, out there anymore, they're in our towns. Other diseases, other places, other people, other, 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 not in my backyard, not my circus, not my monkeys. We Americans largely continue to ignore headlines, at least until climate tri changes trigger global supply chain issues, our empty shelves at Winco, empty lots at the car dealership, and a traffic jam of cargo ships waiting to be unloaded off the coast of San Diego. And you remember that single ginormous ship that was kind of stuck sideways in the Suez Canal? <laughs> wow. All of this forces us to face the inconvenient truth of the interconnectedness of all things, the interconnectedness of all people, all the earth, all the economies. There are no borders. There's no other, only us. Some 2,000 miles to the west and about 2,000 years in our past, according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus went through town and village one after the another, proclaiming and bringing good news of the kingdom of God. His message of love and inclusion that resulted in the flattening of societal structures that favor the wants of the rich and the powerful over the needs of the weak and the poor and the quirky and the queer was a threat to the powers that be. Now in Luke, since about the middle of chapter four, not long after his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, we notice that Jesus had been pretty much going nonstop. <sighs> Teaching, preaching, healing crowds of people in the crowds of these onlookers that inevitably showed up wherever he went. Word got around, this guy made changes. This guy could heal. And all the while he's doing that, He's trying to fit in instruction to his close friends, talking in code, parables that were entertaining to the bystanders and laden with meaning for those who had ears to hear. On this day, in chapter 8, verse 22, the crowds had grown so large that even his mother and his brothers had to come on up to see what's going on and they couldn't even cut through the crowd to speak to him in person. Jesus felt such an affinity for, or responsibility to, maybe, all of the people, that he commented that all of them were his mother and his siblings. They're all his family. He couldn't just leave them. Exhausted, and understandably needing a break, even from his own mom. Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and said, come on, you guys, let's go on to the other side of the lake. So they put out from shore. And while they were, while they were sailing, no surprise, <laughs> he fell asleep. And a windstorm swept down the lake, and their boat began to fill with water. The disciples perceived they were in danger. They went to Jesus and woke him up. Master, master, we're perishing. <sighs> and waking up. 
He rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased, and there was calm. And then he said to them, where is your faith? Crisis averted, with a roll of his eyes and a shake of his head, Jesus settled back down in the part of the boat and resumed his nap. And the terrified disciples were amazed and wisely this time whispered to one another, who is this then that he commands the winds and the water and they obey him? That's Luke 8, 22 to 25 in the NRSV and my own sanctified imagination. I want to know though, what were they thinking? Hollering at Jesus like that? Oh, master, we're going to die. The guy was exhausted, carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Surely his buddies could have worked together and managed a solution and let the poor man rest. And seriously, this must would not have been the disciples' first squall on the water. Andrew, James, John, and Peter, they were fishermen by trade until Jesus came along and called them out to be fishers of men. It was their job. Rain or shine, out on the water, tossing their nets over the side. And then by all accounts, Peter and, or Philip and Nathaniel were from the same area, the same you know, coastal town as these guys. They too must have had some idea of how to pilot a skiff and bail it out if it started to capsize. I wonder, did they just assume, since Jesus was there, that he was going to take care of things? So much so that in the intensity of the moment, it didn't occur to them to use the brains the Creator had given them and the skills their fathers had taught them to do something about the situation. Were they used to seeing themselves as passive spectators? Merely witnesses of Jesus' transforming work? When we think of those first followers, do we identify them as members of Jesus' audience with front row seats whose sole purpose it is to <laughs> applaud and praise him as if he were putting on a show? Yeah, you go, Jesus! Add away! Right that wrong. Heal that sickness. Oh, give those oppressors what for? I see what you did there, Jesus. Oh, Zana, hey, Zana, 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 ho. Zana, hey, Zana, ho, Zana. Reading through the Gospels, we catch glimpses of Jesus' frustration with those he handpicked and called out to be the recipients of his intense mentoring. Times when they just didn't get it. Go through Mark. How many times does he feed people when there isn't any food around? Oh, Master, they're hungry. What should we do? Really, guys? Didn't we just do this in the last chapter? <laughs> At least they didn't get it to the point of buy-in. At least maybe not in this, this part. Ownership of the mission. The original followers, followers, I would suspect, were not called by Jesus to sit passively in the boat and cry, hey ho for a savior, and neither are we. You knew I was gonna say that, didn't you? Following Jesus, we are meant to be co-conspirators, co-creators with Christ in this world that God still loves. All evidence to the contrary, I do believe that. God still loves, that in the end of all things, God is going to get what God wants. We are all the communion of saints, members one of another, all of us part of the body of Christ. This buy-in is the difference between having faith in Jesus and having the faith of Jesus. In allows for passi passivity, and of requires action. There's a whole academic discussion and translation along those lines. The in school of thought and theology focuses on the individual's response 
to Jesus. The emphasis is on what God did through Jesus to atone for us and allow us entrance into eternal glory, usually focusing just on the cross. There is benefit in that. The of crowd, no matter where they stand on that substitutionary atonement thing in the first one of the, the if group, take their cue from the years between Bethlehem and Golgotha. All those years all those lessons, all that ministry, the faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus that drew him to care in real ways for the poor and the hungry and the outcast, that kicked out, opted out, left out of the world. And that wasn't something new that he just made up. Go, go back to... Uh, Micah and any of those, the prophets from the, the First Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, what are they hollering about? They're looking at the way of the world and they're calling the powers that be under the carpet for not doing what God said. God said, care for everybody. Set up all of this stuff so that everyone has a place to sleep and food to eat and care and companionship and family. It wasn't anything new. Jesus was just saying, come on, y'all. Of course, it was new in that with Jesus, it expanded further, not just to the, the Jews, the Hebrews, but thanks to that, oh, that Syrophoenician woman who didn't have a name, who said, yeah, even the dogs are allowed to eat the crumbs off the master's table. And from that point on, Jesus is like, oh, wait a minute, this is bigger than I thought. This is, this is for all y'all. The winds continue to pick up. Waves continue to, th waves threaten to swamp the planet that we live on, the communities we live in. Literal floods and fires and tsunami waves of hatred and bigotry. So we're speaking figuratively and literally about the storms in our world. So let us not be forgetting that we, like the disciples in the boat that day, have some skills skills to navigate choppy waters and meet the challenge of weathering life's and our world's strong storms. We know what needs to be done. We know how to place sandbags to shore up the threatened and build levees to protect the vulnerable, buoy up those in danger of drowning and lift them to dry ground, to provide shelter and a safe space for those who cannot breathe. And like Jesus, welcome everyone to the table for a little bite of something to eat and a sip of something to, to drink. We are not any of us in this storm alone. It is not an individual, but a collective call. And we're not meant to do that without him, without them, without the Holy One. That's what our, our psalm was talking about. God imminent in, under, around, and through even the winds and the thunder and the lightning and the storm. God in and part of God's creation. The Holy One of our ancestors rumbles in the thunder. The voice of the one who created out of chaos calls out in the wind. Adonai is with us. The Divine One hears our cries and answers. We have the faith of Jesus in addition to in Jesus. We have the gifts God has given us. Reason, compassion, empathy, vision, hope, tenacity the never to say die spirit, to use the world we have created in partnership over the millennia with God. We have so many resources at our disposal, disposal and so much knowledge. What are we gonna do with it? The voice of Adonai is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Holy One over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of Adonai is full of majesty. Where is your faith? He asks. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless her people with peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Would you join me in singing, Let Justice Flow Like Streams? And I will let Ms. Wally come up and lead us in that. And I will find the page. Please rise in body or spirit. Hymn 588, Let Justice Flow Like Streams. <clears throat> Reverend Tim Ledbetter real quick here. The sending that we used at my church in Texas was this. Go out as people of God, forgiven, blessed, and filled. Share all you have. Return no one evil for evil. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in a world that needs what we've got to the glory of God. And now may the God of creation and restoration give you confidence in the daily tasks set before you. May the God of love and compassion assure you of your inheritance as a child of God. May the God of guidance and inspiration mold you in the image of divine love. And may the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.